Hello and welcome everyone to our first Monash University Humanities Series panel discussion, Me Too, but Where To From Here. My name is Mandy Berry and I'm Deputy Dean Research in the Faculty of Education at Monash and it's my pleasure and honour to be hosting this event tonight, the panel discussion with our special guest speakers, Dr George Varian from the Faculty of Education, Associate Professor Asha Flynn from Monash Arts Criminology and Dr Natalia Antalak Sapa from Monash Law. So first of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the lands on which we meet today and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd like to specifically acknowledge the Wiradjuri and Budwarong people, communities of the Kulin Nation, who are the ongoing custodians of the land on which Monash University now stands. We pay our respects through our research, our teaching and our learning to elders past, present, and also to their future communities. And welcome from all of the lands that you're joining in from. We're really excited with uh, having so many people come in tonight in this special session. And it's a new initiative, this Humanities Series for Monash in 2021, bringing together the faculties of law, education and arts to provide a broad range of perspectives from different humanities disciplines on topical issues facing society today. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that we couldn't have chosen a more topical issue than the focus of this one. And back when we were planning for this um, event uh, in December last year, who would have predicted the storm of events that have occurred around Australia related to the consequences of sexual violence and harassment that our panelists will talk about tonight. I mentioned that we have people zooming in from everywhere. I think we've got over 25 different countries represented, which is fantastic, and several hundred people who are coming online thanks to the technology. So if you haven't already had a chance to type in where you're from, then please put a message into the, the chat box about that. I'd also like to just give this content warning at this point before we officially begin our panel, because the format of tonight's event will be discussing themes around sexual harassment, sexual violence and image-based abuse. And this may trigger for you particular um, memories or events and that information is available here for you about support and resources if you should need it. So there's um, Lifeline and the eSafety Commissioner. We do encourage you to be part of this conversation during the evening um, because you have, uh, if you have a Twitter account, we uh, encourage you to use your Twitter uh, to um, put in various tags. And we also invite you to put in any comments or questions in the YouTube comments section, but you just need to be logged into YouTube tonight in order to be able to do so. And there will be plenty of opportunities for you to be able to ask questions of the panelists. So we actively encourage you to do that. And you don't have to wait till later on. You can put your questions in now and we'll keep them and be able to offer them to our panelists then. Um, I just would like to just remind you the format of the event will be the panel discussion. So each of our speakers will share something about their research and insights about the ways in which the Me Too movement and its consequences have impacted on and present challenges for structural, legal, social and cultural change from their different perspectives and their different areas of research and work. So let's start by learning a little bit about each of our panelists and their area of research. And I'd like to start by introducing our first panelist, Dr. George Varian from the Faculty of Education at Monash. Hi, Mandy, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is George Varian, as Mandy said, I work at the Faculty of Education and I teach in the Masters of Educational Leadership. I teach subjects uh, like leadership, ethics, ethical decision-making. And um, my interest in gender and, and sexual uh, gender oppression uh, stems from my research in elite private boys schools, where I studied uh, the teachers in elite private boys schools, three schools in two different cities in Australia. And I worked with over 30 uh, teachers during that time. And my research initially really was about uh, how teachers uh, go about their day and, and what are the things that affect them and, and what was the potential or the capacity for teachers to, to make change from the inside of uh, elite private schools. And, and I guess uh, why I connect to the, the question on gender and the, and the current environment is part of my findings from that investigation was really around the issue of sexual harassment of uh, teachers that I found while uh, doing my study. And, and I guess that's something we'll be talking about a bit more uh, tonight. But I guess when I want to talk about the way I look at uh, elite private schools, 
Uh, I guess I think about them in a quite a holistic way. And I'm looking at the school culture, what is in the school culture that uh, enables teachers to do what they need to do or, and also what limits them. And, and when I'm talking about culture, I'm talking about things that people say they do and, they, and how they relate to each other. And this happens in you know, everyday ways as well as it's baked into the you know, rituals the policies of, of institutions like elite private schools as well. So uh, I took a holistic look at teachers and what they did. And one of the elements of that was the issue of sexual harassment and, and, and the question around uh, sexism and, and, the, and the types of masculinities that were produced in these schools and what that means to, to the greater community. So that is my research in a nutshell. And um, yeah, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much, George. Yeah, we look forward to hearing more about that. And the emphasis recently in the media has been on students, but it's going to be very interesting to talk with you about the, from the perspective of teachers, which we haven't heard as much about. So looking forward to um, having you join us in the panel very soon. Um, our next presenter to introduce herself is Associate Professor Asha Flynn um, from Criminology, as I mentioned before, in the Faculty of Arts at Monash. So welcome, Asha, and thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'll let you introduce yourself. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, so my name is Asha Flynn, and as Mandy said, I'm an Associate Professor of Criminology at Monash. I'm also the Vice President of the Australian and New Zealand Society of Criminology. So much of my work to date has been around sexual violence and technology facilitated abuse. So this, this is things like image-based abuse, AI facilitated abuse and online harms. So I thought when we were given a little brief of have a chat for five minutes about what you do, I, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about some of my work on image-based abuse, uh, which includes three key behaviours. So when we talk about image-based abuse, we're talking about the creation or taking of nude or sexual images without someone's consent, the non-consensual distribution or sharing of those images, and threats to share nude or sexual images. So I was going to talk through some of my findings from my most recent research, uh, mainly focusing on uh, the pervasiveness of image-based abuse. So my most recent survey of just over 6,100 people across Australia, New Zealand and the UK, so they were aged 16 to 69, found that one in three of those participants actually reported experiencing at least one of those three forms of image-based abuse, and one in seven had experienced all three. Most common was someone having a nude or sexual image taken of them without their consent. Importantly, we found that some groups were more likely than others to report ever experiencing being a victim of image-based abuse. And this reflects, sadly, patterns of abuse and harassment in our community more broadly, where groups that experience inequality and discrimination are at greater risk of multiple forms of victimisation. So in our survey, we found one in two Indigenous Australians, one in three LGBTQI plus respondents, one in two respondents with a disability and one in three young people aged 16 to 19 years had experienced image-based abuse. In terms of perpetration, we found one in six of the participants acknowledged that they had engaged in image-based abuse behaviours. So most commonly, people disclosed having taken a nude or sexual image of a person without their consent, with almost 16% reporting doing this. This was followed by one in 10 saying they'd sent images on to someone else without that person's consent, and just under 9% saying that they had threatened someone with distribution of a nude or sexual image. But I also just wanted to quickly reflect in the very short time I've got left before answering any questions you might have on technology facilitated abuse about sexual violence in our community. There has been so much happening over the past three decades pushing for reform to criminal justice responses to sexual violence, to cultural understandings of sex, respectful relationships and consent, and to how we as a society support those who are experiencing this horrific form of abuse. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, one in five Australian women and one in 20 Australian men have experienced sexual assault since the age of 15. Most of these assaults are occurring in private spaces. Most are against women by a man that is known to them. Yet we know that very few people are contacting the police. And we're gonna talk through some of the reasons why this might be the case later today. But what research has consistently shown us is that victim survivors say they want to have their experiences heard. They want to have the wrong against them acknowledged and to know that something will be done to stop the perpetrator from harming others. 
Sadly, we know that often the opposite occurs. So whether it's workplaces and other organisations responding to sexual harassment and sexual assault or formal responses in our criminal justice system, victims are often left feeling silenced and sidelined. So the Me Too movement was initially started by the absolutely inspirational African-American civil rights advocate, Tarana Burke. And I just wanted to quickly say um, that I had the privilege of being able to hear Tarana speak to this movement back in 2019. And she described the reasons why she would created this space for women to speak out publicly about their victimization experiences. And I, I won't go into the details now because we can cover it later, but essentially it was because she didn't know what to do and she didn't do anything when someone had disclosed sexual assault to her. And I think over the last few weeks in Australia, we've seen this play out time and time again. So I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to talk through some of these insights with you in terms of technology facilitated abuse and sexual violence more broadly. Thanks, Mandy. Thanks so much, Asha. Yeah, I'm sure there are there's many different topics that people will be keen to talk with you about this in terms of the criminal justice system, as well as the forms of image-based sexual abuse that uh, appear to be on the rise and also have a, a really shocking in terms of the ways in which they're manifesting. So, um, so that was Asha. And I'm delighted now to introduce our third panel member, Dr. Natalia Antelak Sapa from Monash Law. So, um, Natalia, welcome. And let's hear some about yourself and the work that you've been doing. Thank you, Mandy. So, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Natalia, and I'm a lecturer here at the Faculty of Law at Monash University. I'm also the deputy convener of the Transnational and Comparative Criminal Law Group and a member of the Feminist Legal Group. I'm so pleased that you could all join us this evening and I'm also looking forward to learning from my fellow panelists. To give a little overview, my principal areas of research are competitive criminal law and procedure, sentencing, access to justice and the death penalty. In terms of the area of this evening's focus, I've made submissions to the Victorian Law Reform Commission on the topic of stealthing, which I'll discuss later this evening. And my current research is considering the role of problem solving courts in sexual offence matters. Um, my work is largely comparative and socio-legal, so I look to other jurisdictions as to what we can learn about bettering our criminal justice system. And today I'll draw on some examples and initiatives from New Zealand, the United Kingdom and Queensland. I also teach criminal law subjects in both the undergraduate and JD degree here at Monash Law School. And I see firsthand how valuable and impactful these discussions are for our students in understanding the complexity of the issues and the challenges for reform. So I hope you enjoy this evening's discussions. Thank you very much, Natalia. So you can see we have a very rich a range of experience and expertise from our panel members. And, um, and now we're going to transition into the opportunity to be able to talk with them about the kinds of topics that they've foreshadowed here. So I'll just encourage all of our speakers to come back online so that we can make our panel happen. And just as we're transitioning in, and Ash has already mentioned about Tarana Burke, so I'll just say a little bit more to kind of um, help contextualise and I'm sure remind people, because this is something that most of us know already quite a lot about, that the Me Too movement itself is a relatively recent phenomenon, even though the issues that it highlights around sexual abuse and gendered violence are longstanding. So um, Asha mentioned about American civil rights activist Tarana Burke, um, who began using the phrase Me Too in 2006 to raise awareness of sexual assault and abuse of women of colour and promote empowerment through empathy. And we'll be keen to hear more about um, what Asha has learned from her too um, later. And 11 years later, the Me Too hashtag movement was born after actress Alyssa Milano posted a tweet encouraging women to say Me Too if they had experienced sexual harassment or assault. So in the ensuing months and years, more and more victims have come forward to share their stories and their anger about how they've been mistreated and silenced. And in recent months in Australia, a storm of allegations of rape, sexual assault and misconduct regarding members of parliament and their staff have been reported. And these cases have shone a light on embedded sexualist cultures and how sexual assault and harassment is being dealt with more broadly across all areas of our society, not only in parliament, but as we've heard already from Georgia and Australia's school system, workplaces and other areas. So we might very well ask ourselves, has anything changed since a Me Too movement began? So I'd like to open up now to each of our panellists to comment, if you will, on 
how the Me Too movement may have changed the landscape in terms of your area of focus. And I know, um, Ashley, you already um, mentioned a little bit about that and how your focus is being further influenced by recent events in Australia. Um, so, Natalia, can I open up to you first in, for that question? Thank you, Mandy. Um, so particularly in the criminal justice sphere, I think it's really raised a significant awareness and particularly about how common sexual harms are, but also the different ways in which they may be perpetrated and experienced. Um, I hope that it's emboldened people to share their stories. And I know, for example, from speaking, whether it's with law reform agencies or public in general, the ability to, I think, listen more and be guided by people's experiences as to what they expect from the criminal justice system, I think is far more crucial. Um, I think the actual hashtag has given us almost a dialogue about what we are discussing because in many common instances, we'll say, oh, well, the Me Too movement and somehow that will be connected with that. So I think a lot of the focus has been on thinking through if we know how prevalent these harms are, we're learning about the new ways in which offences may be perpetrated and experiences, then how do we ensure that the criminal justice system evolves into respecting those and incorporating them in a, in a respectful manner. So I think that's been sort of the most significant change I've seen. Thanks, thanks. Uh, and Asha, I mean, I think you can connect into some of the issues here that Natalia is talking about. Um, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks, Mandy. Um, I, I completely agree with Natalia. I think what, what we've seen, I mean, there, there's been some positive shifts in discussion that are starting to happen at, at long last but I think what we've seen over the last you know few weeks in particular in Australia um, is we've seen some incredibly brave women coming forward to speak about their experiences of sexual violence at the hands of some very powerful men in very powerful institutions and we've also seen their, uh, their experiences um, attempting to be silenced by many so we've seen our nation's leaders try to sideline or downplay victimisation. We've seen victim blaming. We've seen the, the he said, she said narrative start to play out. But I think what we've also seen and, and where we can take a glimmer of hope is that a large portion of society are saying enough is enough. We saw tens of thousands of people marching across the country to, to end violence against women. We've had um, more women coming forward and reporting their experience. We've had school principals, which George can speak to, stand up and say the culture in our society and in our school is not good enough and we need to change it. So what we're starting to see is a real cultural shift that we so badly need to be able to start to improve formal responses to sexual violence and to help educate and prevent it from occurring in the first place. And I think one of the, the most important elements of this is that we need leadership. So we need it at all levels in this country, in all workplaces, schools, universities, sporting clubs, friendship groups, families. We need people to, to step up and recognise that sexual violence is not going away, but we need to set a new standard for, for respect and justice. And it feels like now could be the time for us to be having these conversations very, very seriously and, and at very high levels across the country. Mm, mm. And thanks, Asha. And so, George, those ideas around cultures of silence and leadership and time for change, I mean, that resonates a lot with the kinds of work that you've been doing. Would you like to comment on the how recent events may have shone a light on the work that you're doing? Look, I, I think it's it's amazing the the wave of of um, reporting around this issue at the moment is is pushing a lot of uh, pushing my work into the the media, and and I'm taken up in that and and trying to you know contribute. Um, it's amazing that just listening to the other panelists their their perspective on on that visibility. Uh, I, when I think about leadership and and my comments about leadership, I, I think. Leading can come from anywhere within the community. I think everyone would agree. It doesn't have to come from the, the top, the people at the top. It comes from people really, you know, taking it on themselves to also uh, work together to, to, to demand change. I think that's a really, like, we've got to get beyond just let's have the conversation. And I think we're seeing that where people are demanding change. And then, you know, and I think that has to be sustained uh, on top of this visibility if, if we're, you know, going to get real change. It's that, that pressure. Mm -hmm. Well, George, could I just follow up? Because um, in a recent article that you wrote, you talked about the strange cultures of silence in yeah. elite boys' school. So can you unpack that idea a little bit more and yeah. how do they get created and, and why do they persist? Well, there, there are many reasons for this. So, again, when I think about as a, a, 
an ecology or a, a, like what is a culture, right? And, uh, you know, people say things in their day and they do things and they relate in certain ways. And these are everyday ways, like for example, like an everyday type of sexism that might pervade an organization. And it's also baked into the rituals that uh, privilege certain norms uh, around masculinity, for example, uh, hyper competition in these schools as well. And also the valorization of the masculine and the other to that is these feminine models. And so women in these schools have very precarious positions trying to take up uh, you know, very heteronormative roles like uh, the motherly type teacher or, uh, you know, or the, someone who can match it with, uh, the, with the men. And then, you know, it's very difficult to, to navigate these uh, male logics because it is male logics really that they're navigating. And so often uh, it, what I found was that the, their voices end up being marginalized in these schools. Uh, and, and that marginalization disempowers them. And, and, then, and then when they, when they come to have trouble uh, with, with the boys in these schools in terms of being uh, sexually harassed, uh, they find that you know, the school tends to problematize their practice rather than thinking it's something wrong with the boys. So in a sense, uh, schools kind of take their school to be fine in a sense, and then it's the teacher's problem because you almost can't say like these schools are here to stay and we're always going to have boys schools. If you take that as your starting point, then, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you improve things? Right? So what happens is that the teachers end up being the ones that are blamed for their, their issues. And it becomes a question of, of teaching rather than a question of uh, sexual harassment, which is what it is. Mm -hmm. And also it seems like a, a question of, of victim blaming rather than doing anything system, systematic yeah. about that issue. Yeah. And, and in terms of that systematicness, so it's, it's not just the blaming, it's not just the disbelief. Uh, there's also these you know, terribly unbalanced relationships of power in these schools uh, mm -hmm. where you've got uh, high fee paying parents, uh, plenty at stake here. Uh, schools that want to make sure that they keep the parent body and the students happy and teachers really finding themselves at, at the bottom of the pecking order, so to speak. Uh, so they, they don't, uh, don't feel they really can voice these issues. And after a time, I also found in my data that, you know, teachers would tend to internalize these types of issues as well and, and blame themselves. Uh, and, and all these things kind of play together. They kind of mesh together to uh, create what I then you would call a culture of silence. Uh, and, and therefore, when you come to talking about what do we fix here, it's never just going to be one thing. It's going to be a, a myriad of issues that you slowly got to unpack in order to actually make substantive change. And that's where the difficulty really is for these schools. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, one of the things that is happening now, it appears, is it's breaking the culture of silence and some people who are willing to come forward very publicly to talk about their experiences. And um, I'm just going to um, ask um, Ash now because... Uh, from your research, you reported that survivors can feel hesitant to report their crimes and um, especially victims of sexual assault who don't go to the police. And so can, can you comment on that and what kind of law reform maybe needs to take place in order to change this situation? I mean, if the kinds of teachers that George is talking about get silenced, then how do we, within the legal and uh, judicial system, help to be able to make those changes? And probably Natalia had something to say about that too. Yeah, so I think looking at the, the first part of that question around um, why why people might feel hesitant to come forward, and the the research has shown us it is it is fear, it's 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 a, a sense of shame, uh, uh, the treatment that historically um, victims have experienced at the hands of police at, at the court system, and the very low rates of of conviction for sexual violence when you are going through an incredibly traumatic court process um, where often the odds are against you. Um, victims feel violated, they can feel exposed by the perpetrator's actions. So there's a, a range of different reasons why people are not going to come forward to report initially or who may decide they never want to go through those options. I, I think it's important at this point to note that there are um, alternatives to, to formally reporting to police so that where victim survivors can seek support um, or talk about what's happened to them. So we have a, a national helpline, um, there's 1800 Respect, there's sexual assault counselling services available in every state and territory and some of our states also have options for victims to make anonymous or confidential informal reports to the police. Um, I recently with colleagues wrote about how the Victorian Law Reform Commission at the moment is also looking at restorative justice as an option 
for victims. So in, in broad terms, this basically means that a, a victim and a perpetrator um, can come together with an expert to support, to acknowledge the impacts of the crime and try and find a way to repair the harm that's been done. In terms of image-based abuse, if you're a, a victim of that, you can report it through the Office of the eSafety Commissioner's online portal and they'll take carriage of trying to get those images removed. And they've, they've got about a 90% success rate at the moment of that. So there are some alternatives there. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be reforming our legal mm -hmm. system to actually make, make the formal responses worthwhile and effective for victims. Um, I'll make a comment, couple of points on that and then Natalia will definitely be able to speak more for some of this, but I think one of the key areas that um, colleagues and I, particularly Rachel Bergen, uh, have been working on is uh, consent law and how we, we actually need to change. There are so many varied definitions of consent across Australia. Um, and one of the ways to address this, a, a problematic understanding of consent is through what's known as affirmative consent. So essentially, this requires consent to be actively given by actions and or words um, before and continuously throughout a sexual act. So under a law that has a, a, an affirmative consent model, you can't infer that consent has happened. You can't just assume from the behaviour from someone else or what they were wearing or that they supposedly flirted with you at some point during the night or that they've agreed to have sex with you before, that that means that at that particular time they're agreeing to engage in sex with you. Mm. So or sexual activity. So it, it basically puts the onus on the person who's initiating the sex to be making sure, taking steps to see what is it that that, to, that I can confirm that this person is interested in, in what I'm suggesting and, and wants to go through with it. And most Australian states don't currently require someone to take active steps to determine another's consent. And for me, that seems to be one of the, the biggest problems is this, this confusion around what consent is. And while uh, some will argue that, oh, it's very difficult, you don't have those kind of conversations in a naturally, organically flowing sexual encounter, you can and you should be mm -hmm. having those conversations. And mm -hmm. I'll hand over to Natalia to talk through some more ideas. Thanks. Um, I absolutely agree with a lot of comments you've made there, Asher. And one of the things, for example, that strikes me is even between jurisdictions in Australia, we have different terminology that we label certain offences. So, for example, in Victoria, we have the offences of rape and sexual assault. If you go to New South Wales, what we would refer to as rape is referred to as sexual assault. So already you have a disconnect there in terms of the language that people and community members may use and be able to discuss in an open format. And then between the jurisdictions, you have different ways of approaching the consent test. Um, in Victoria, you have presumably a communicative model, you have free agreement, you have a number of circumstances that we are told specifically consent will not be uh, uh, adopted in these circumstances. So for example, if a person does not say or do anything, we cannot infer consent. But the challenge is, as Asher has communicated, it still doesn't require the person to seek that consent. So there's a certain gap there in terms of moving from a communicative model to an affirmative um, model. And in addition, um, there's other challenges around the attrition rate that, for example, include you know, police discretion about whether they will continue. And so there, for example, we might highlight some of the challenges around police education. Um, there may be issues around evidence and whether or not the strength of the evidence is valuable. So there again, may be alternative mechanisms for seeking justice rather than the sort of traditional format of a criminal role. Um, and one thing that struck me from what Asha has talked about as well and from my own research is that for many people, before they make a formal police report, they'll tend to seek informal and formal support services. Um, and so for me, I've been thinking of this as a broader sexual assault system and the criminal justice system is simply one component of that, albeit an incredibly crucial one because that's how we signify community standards to some extent. And it's also important for these agencies, for these support services to sometimes be a bit more unified and holistic in their approach. Um, and for example, Queensland's government introduced in recent years, in 2019, a sort of more strategy about, uh, and they called it prevent, support, believe. And so all these agencies understood that this is the message that they're meant to be incorporating and it allowed for a consistency in messaging and advice and support. Um, and one thing I'm very struck by and, and I'm very passionate about is 
across the criminal justice system, we have a lack of recognition of the importance of the victim in a lot of the roles. You know, the prosecutor acts on behalf of the state and the victim and survivor is often lost in all of this discussion. Mm -hmm. And um, the UK, for example, have an independent advisor that is not a police person, that is not a defense counsel, that is there to have the best interest of that person. And they liaise with the police. They may talk to you know, support services. They guide that person and help them figure out what best choices. And I think what a valuable example that is in terms of making sure that that person's interests are protected and not at the expense of others. Yes, for sure. And so how, um, for instance, it's common for victims to wait for a long time if they want to make a formal report, Natalia, around a sexual offence. So how does the delay in reporting affect the legal issues of such kinds of crimes? Could, could you comment on that? So one of the things that, um, of course, happen is that people may very well wait before they make a police report. And I do note that sometimes there are the phrase historical rape allegations. Yes, we've noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. And you can take kind of an issue with that slogan because part of the challenge here is that, you know, if you look at it, perhaps all rape reporting may be historical on some level because there may be a delay in that regard. So we shouldn't infer anything negative from that. Um, some challenges arise typically around the evidence that may be, you know, able to be accessed, let's say, 20, 30 years on from the event. So with institutional abuse cases that we may all be familiar with, some of the challenges with childhood sex offences, uh, sorry, offences against children of sexual offences is around the evidence point. But there is a reason why indictable offences do not have a time limit. And so we do encourage people to come forward and report and make sure that the justice system can absolutely address those issues. It's very crucial and critical. And mm -hmm. I'm sure Asha might have some commentary as well. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, in addition to that, I, I support, I think there is always a need around things like um, increased police training, which you were talking about, Natalia, and, and also the training of, of support um, workers for victims to understand how important that initial contact is. I think it's also really important, and, and perhaps George can speak to some of this too, is around you know the sex and respectful relationships, education, and needing to start that early and be consistent and inclusive about the type of language and lessons that, that people are being um, taught and promoting consent as a normal practice within all our interactions. But I think this is, is vital as well um, for, for adults, for, ev like for everyone in the community to be having these types of conversations and to understand that, that often, so in the case of image-based abuse, sometimes a victim will find out that their image has been shared from friends or family members or um, you know, even just acquaintances on Facebook, for example, that have, that have come across the image. And it, the, the first reaction of the people that they hear from makes such a difference to how they feel and how they feel they should respond and, and whether they report it and whether they seek help and whether they blame themselves, which no one should ever do in those circumstances. The blame lays squarely with the perpetrator, the abuser who, who misused and mishandled the imagery. So I think it's really important that when we're having these conversations, we often think about it in terms of young children and, and educating them, which is absolutely vital. But we also need to make sure that as a society, we're understanding the, the harms of sexual violence, the harms of things like technology facilitated abuse and how important our first response is. Mm -hmm. And well, just before we um, pass over to George, I think it's maybe relevant to talk about the experiences, as you mentioned, there are people who don't know that their image is being used for image-based sexual abuse. For instance, um, Noelle Martin, who found herself, you know, a victim of deep fake and, and also not only trying to do something about it, but the consequences for her and the difficult consequences that she went through as she tried to tell her story or as she was trying to be able to make reform um, I don't know if you want to comment on that at all, Asha. Yes, definitely. One of the most um, powerful young women that I've, I've come across is Noelle. She is incredible um, what she's been through and the advocacy she's had. And she has made such a difference in shaping laws around Australia to actually criminalise image-based abuse and to get people to understand the, the extent of the harms and the consequences of, of this type of abuse. So um, Noelle was a victim. Yes, she came across uh, imagery of herself that had been doctored onto pornographic photographs. So they'd taken photos of her from her Instagram page um, and, and placed it onto pornography. 
as a result of her stepping forward and talking about her experiences and advocating for change, um, she won Young Australian of the Year in Western Australia and she continued to experience victimisation. So she was trolled by numerous people. They doctored more imagery of her. Um, they changed, for example, her holding her award um, for winning Young Australian of the Year and doctored that into a pornographic image to suggest she was holding something else. And again, then publicised this and, and plastered it all over the internet. And this is I, I, a really brave young woman who was stepping forward to say enough is enough. I don't want this to happen to anyone else. This is how it's affected me. And, and mm -hmm. she was treated like that. But it, it has been one of the most powerful things that we've seen recently is the victim advocate and the victim survivor's voice being included in law reform. And it is something that we're starting to see in a positive way. We saw it in terms of domestic violence with Rosie Baffey, um, how she be, she became a prominent a voice for mm. why we needed the change that we did. And we've seen that with Noelle as well in terms of helping shape image-based abuse laws across Australia. Mm. So I think there's some some really powerful messages there. Um, but it, 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 you know, the consequences of standing up, particularly as a female, and, yeah. and saying this is okay, a, a, a significant can be quite significant. Yeah, and and so George, um, circling back to you, um, it, we're talking about the responsibilities of schools in terms of you know how we um, expect young people to behave. Um, does your research go into that, or like how would you respond to some of those issues around how do we reshape cultures? Is it is it possible through education? Look, uh, I think it needs to be known. I think it's I should be known that like there are academics have been working in this space for quite some time like Deb Ollis at Deakin, you know, for many years around respectful relationships in, in Victoria, and, and perhaps that hasn't had enough uh, socialization in the uh, private school world as it has in the state system. And there certainly is a really important place for this kind of education of, of students, but, but also importantly, not just students, but teachers as well, administration, staff in these schools, you know, and parent body even more widely. It is really, when you think about how all these elements play together, it's not just about problematizing kids, it's about seeing how all the other actors that are involved in these institutions are coming together and creating the environment that's there. So it's a really, we need a quite holistic approach. And I think there are many academics that could probably speak to this much better than I could. Uh, one thing I would, inter what's interesting about the, the current situation when you watch the, the conversation that's going on in the media and you think about the language that's used to frame like historical rape, uh, the historical component, or, or even when, when uh, politicians or, or people get out and talk about uh, conversations that are, you know, we are about, let's have these conversations. It's always about seeming to me about saying, yes, we'll have the conversation. It's almost like moving the game down the field rather than saying, okay, no, actually we need to start doing something now. And mm -hmm. I think that there's, there's ways in which uh, uh, the other elements as well, when I see in the, the way they talk about how uh, it, it's it's a societal problem and, and the problem then is everywhere, but then it's nowhere at all. And I think it's important to remember that each institution has its own mechanisms in which they create these uh, effects. And, mm -hmm. and I think they, that they need to take ownership of that at, at the level of their institutions and, and work towards uh, improving it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And well, maybe we could even ask ourselves the question, um, are young people dealing with this better than um, an older generation? You know, maybe maybe the focus is around the um, older generation and the ways in which they've been enculturated and, and grown up and responded to some of these issues too. And um, I, I just link into what you also talked about, the need for courageous and moral leadership for school leaders in elite boys' schools. So, you know, what, what, would, what would that look like if um, we were going to see that kind of courageous leadership? You know, if, the, if we need to do more than talk about it and say, change needs to happen what, what change would those kinds of things be bringing about yeah i i think this is a really important question uh i think on the one hand i am speaking to leaders because i'm speaking to the school heads but i'm also speaking to leaders in the school at every level as well and and what could this look like i think in a in a way is to to really go and say okay uh you know, put everything on the table in a sense not just we just need to improve this or we just need to add this program in and everything will be fixed but that the whole the whole infrastructure of the the for example in elite private schools the whole infrastructure of boys education and and elite uh, schools for example uh where these high fee paying exclusive schools they all kind of go on the table in terms of thinking about how uh, you produce this uh, notion of entitlement 
and and this kind of us versus them aspect and and all the tribalism that actually goes with the, with these gender segregated schools. I, I really think if you think about courage and, and moral courage, it's about thinking about the right thing to do rather than the you know the the pragmatic thing to do as as mm -hmm. such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I, yeah, I could speak forever about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And understanding what the right thing is to do. I mean, yeah, how those interpretations are, are made is, is another matter as well too. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit um, to ask um, actually Asha about um, the relationship between law and technology, because it seems like technology is moving at a very fast pace. And in terms of image-based sexual abuse, uh, it, it appears to be proliferating. So can the law ever catch up with this kind of technology change? And, and or, or what can we do about this situation to uh, properly address this kinds of um, crimes? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's one of the, the biggest difficulties that we see is, is how can the law keep up with technology? And are we able to just keep introducing new offences without over-criminalising everything and, and making it more complex and making it more difficult for um, police to stay on top of what types of offences there are, what applies to which crime and, and all those sorts of issues. So with, with image-based abuse, um, it's actually now every state and territory except for Tasmania um, have enacted offences which criminalise um, the distribution of, of what they call invasive or intimate images without consent. And some have also criminalised the threat to distribute images. Um, so we, we've seen some really positive uh, steps forward in terms of the law in those regards. But when we start to look at other aspects of how image-based abuse is um, transforming through things like AI and the way that we're seeing um, like the deep fakes example of, of Noel, for, uh, as we spoke about before, um, the laws aren't keeping up with those types of imagery. So, for example, in Victoria, while it is an offence to um, take an image without someone's consent, it's not actually an offence to create an image without somebody's consent. So there, there's a, a challenge there because technically a deep fake is that you're creating the image, you're not actually taking the image itself. We've also seen problems around um, in terms of uh, most of these offences involve some kind of publication or distribution element. If you're creating a deep fake for your own personal use, so you're not sharing that with anyone else, you're doing it for your own voyeuristic sexual gratification, um, the harm is still there to, to the person that you're doing this to, but because you're not publishing it or sharing it with others, um, technically as well, that doesn't fall under certain types of offences. So we are seeing the law failing to keep up in that regard. The law is a really important mechanism to send a message to society to say that this type of behaviour is not condoned and we do not support it. But I do think that when we are talking about different types of laws that can be introduced, whether they're criminal or civil, we also need to look at a multifaceted response. So particularly with technology, we need to be thinking about um, corporate responsibility. So looking at um, how platforms are being governed in this regard, we need to be looking at te um, technical responses, look, using the technology. So with things like deepfakes, you can actually detect uh, whether it's a, a manipulated image or not. So we could be asking platforms to be stepping up and trying to detect these types of things and prevent them from being shared in the first instance, as opposed to necessarily putting the onus on victims to identify that this mm. happened or bystanders and report that they're finding it. So I think there's a, a broad range of mechanisms and responses that we need to think about and that we need to be incorporating into responses. But, but certainly the law is an important avenue. Um, we do also need to be looking at, at where else we can be holding um, companies and organisations and, and particularly at internet platforms accountable for, for their role in creating an environment that allows the facilitation and sharing of this type of imagery. Yeah, and um, to take George's point and I think others around that more ho holistic framework for sure. Um, Natalia, can I just ask, does the sexual offences framework help us in this respect in terms of being able to identify and, and report this kind of criminal activity? In terms of the technology aspect, I think it's an evolving um, aspect where I think the current framework is not, as Asha pointed out, um, developed sufficiently enough to allow for capturing such behaviour. Um, and another challenge that I'd just like to follow on from that is we had a lot of discussion around when um, sexting was occurring and particularly when, for example, 
young members of the community are participating in that conduct, some of the challenges for the criminal justice system is, of course, that those members could be potentially prosecuted with the um, produ production dissemination of child pornography, which is a very serious sexual offence in our community, as it should be. The downside of that is that those children potentially might be on the sex offenders registry list forever. So there's also a mechanism of trying to address certain behaviours that might be committed by young persons in the community and having perhaps a dual system where we don't over criminalize and don't make the criminal justice system overreach there and that may tie back into George's discussions about education rather than criminalization whereas for adult offenders um, yeah as Asha said in addition to other mechanisms the importance of the criminal justice system's standard of the community and reflecting that is very crucial um, yeah I think that's sort of in, yeah. in technology role. So how, how does it work, just picking up on the point that you made about young people and sexting, how, how does that work in terms of a criminal offence at the moment? Um, so since then there have been um, developments and reforms to ensure that that is no longer the case and to make sure that we are not criminalising unnecessarily young offenders because of the significant consequences that would otherwise happen. Um, and for most there might be a fine attached, so we've moved towards making it a summary offence rather than a serious indictable offence through that mechanism. Yep. Mm. Um, I'm going to just ask George a question now, which, and I'm sure it's relevant to others as well in relation to people's fearfulness around engaging with some of these kinds of issues and particularly in schools and teachers, you know, um, uh, these particular topics are teachers expected to be um, rolling out these programs and materials where it's not the kind of usual business as usual, I suppose, for schools. So how do, how do you manage that sort of situation when it's sensitive and difficult um, for teachers and schools? It, uh, really good question. Yeah, I, as a as a former teacher myself, I mean, just a, just the technical skills you feel on some level, I imagine the, that you think you just don't have the understanding enough to engage with these. But I think also at the same time, you know, teachers have a moral purpose anyway, and and maybe we've been we can be distracted by ATARs and the competition that it involves in in getting the scores and 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 all that aspects of school that this is what we are there to do be discipline specific but really we have a moral obligation and I think a lot of teachers recognize that and I think with the right supports in place uh, with the right conversations uh, being had at the level of uh, the staff uh, and between the, the school and, and parents I think then that would help and then put in the right resources you build the capacity to have those conversations I don't think they can just emerge uh, organically, I think you need to really build capacity for having that. And I think that's really, if you're going to have uh, schools transition to more gender just uh, models of schooling, they really need to be building that capacity and thinking about how they can go about doing that. Do you have any helpful comments about how, what the right kinds of conversations would be or how you build capacity? Yeah, uh, again, I would defer to people that are more, uh, I guess, uh, who are specialized in this particular area about. But I think it, it just comes down to uh, having that, uh, you know, it's not just about handing over a program to a teacher and say, you just deploy this, but about, you know, training and about uh, helping teachers come to understand how they can engage with this different issue and I think it's it's just such an important issue I don't think teachers would fumble this if you give them half a chance uh, I think I think if you I think if you give them the chance you give them the right resources and you you really are serious about change I think teachers uh, will will stand will stand up I, and I, I hope that's the case and I do believe that that would be the case mm -hmm. yeah um, and I guess it's uh avoiding outsourcing sometimes of those things so that, um, you know, we've addressed it through a particular kind of initiative or the same as going through perhaps in workplace. We've, uh, everyone's done the module now, so it should be okay, you know. What's yeah. the responsibility that we take on individually, personally, morally and collectively for making sure that our, you know, behaviour is, is appropriate and sensitive as well? Thanks. Um, so just um, thinking now for each of you um, in terms of one thing that you could change, if you had the ability to be able to change one thing in relation to the issues we've talked about, sexual violence and abuse, what, what, what's one thing that you would like to be able to see change in, in the short term and in the longer term? And perhaps if we start with Natalia. 
Thank you. That's such a um, difficult question to answer. Like, <laughs> Sorry about that. Ideas for reform. Um, I think for me, I've been reflecting a lot about about two crucial issues from my research. One of them is we tend to, in other areas of the criminal law, treat consent very seriously. And so, for example, in property law offences, we would suggest that if someone's obtained someone's consent through misleading and deceptive conduct, that's vitiated. Um, and yet with sexual offences, that consent is so intricately related to autonomy, to dignity, to respect. Um, and with instances such as stealthing, I feel like we're trying to make almost the opposite argument. We're trying to find ways in which somehow that can be justified in the circumstances. So I think I'd like to explore a little bit more about the importance of the role of consent at the heart of all of these issues and how crucial they are to those values that, that we both have as a community, but also to the autonomy of the individual. Um, I think the role of victim survivors is so crucial in terms of future reform and I'm particularly keen on the implementation of the restorative justice elements and problem solving courts. So the trials that occur in, for example, New Zealand and New York demonstrate a greater satisfaction with the process. And it is important for victim survivors to drive that process for us because as experts, as academics, as judicial officers, police officers, we may have one version of the experience of this process, but we don't know what it feels like to go through it. And so the more we're prepared to listen, I think, and mm. incorporate those voices and implement them into significant change, that allows us to kind of do away with what the norm is. Let's sit down and go, it's not what we've always done, but let's look to the future and see what dramatic things can we do as a different method? Because what we're doing now is clearly not working. Yeah. So those are just some of the comments I'd make. Yes, thanks. So following up on George's idea, it's not just about sort of shifting little bits around in the system, but it's remaking the system. Um, Asha, your ideas about a, a shorter and a longer term ambition, if you could change things. Sure, yeah, I, I actually love Natalia's response, so it's hard to follow up with something <laughs> <laughs> from that. I I agree in, in terms of consent. I think, it, I, I think it is short term and a long term goal if we had national leaders that stood up and took these issues seriously and respond in a way that is not referring to uh, uh, having having to associate it with a daughter or having to associate it with with um, you know talking to their wife to get advice on on these female issues, if, if we had people that could stand up and actually say, you know what, sexual violence is affecting one in five women, one in 20 men by the age of 15, like from, from the age mm. of 15. So I think that for me, we need real leadership on this. And I know George spoke about leadership in terms of we need it at every level, not just in terms of, you know, the, the main people we need it, we need it in families, we need it in um, education. But I think we also need it at, at a federal level, at a state level, we need our politicians to be able to stand up and say in the same way that we had Dan Andrews stand up in relation to, to violence against women in domestic violence context to take a real stand and say this isn't good enough and we're, we're going to have a commission and we're going to implement changes and we're going to try and make a difference. We need that with sexual violence. As Natalia said, we need to look at what we can do that may be fundamentally different from what we're doing now and if that means we have to look at a legal system that operates in a different way when we're talking about sexual violence offending um, and, and victimization then maybe that's what we need to do because like Natalia said it, it is not working our system is not working in the way it is now if we've got almost 90 percent of women not reporting to police that they have been sexually assaulted mm -hmm. something is dramatically wrong with our system so mm -hmm. I think that at, at both the short term and long term I, I'd love to see some leadership and some real significant change, involvement of victim survivor voices in those change, reflecting on lived experiences and, and looking to, to how we can have a multifaceted response that incorporates the law, education, prevention mechanisms, and, and again, looking at corporate and social responsibility. Mm. Thanks, Asha. I think we would all love to see that courageous and moral leadership from the federal government at the moment in relation to these issues, absolutely, which takes us to George, who actually talked about that in terms of um, schooling. And do you have something that you could say in a short and longer term that you would like to see change? Yeah, I, I guess now I've got two things, which is good, because if I had just one thing, I don't think I could really focus on one thing. But in the short term, I'd like to see the conversation uh, kept up. 
at the, at the, in the media before, I, you know, suddenly the circus leaves town and then it's all forgotten. I, I like to see in the short term that we at least maintain the conversation around these issues. Uh, in the longer term, when I think about schools, I think about the, the teachers, right? Without the teachers as the partners in these schools, nothing's going to happen. So I would, one thing I could wish for would be teachers that would be empowered to, to start dealing with this issue and how that might look. You know, I don't think that's necessarily going to come from the top down. I think it's going to be about teachers organizing together to start having these conversations and so to push from the middle, I guess. And so I guess that's the one big thing that teachers would be empowered. And, and in a sense, it's, it's, to, it's a big dream to reverse some of that deprofessionalization of that role uh, to focusing on, you know, ATARs and those kind of narrow ideas of curriculum to a more broader, uh, that moral purpose of teaching that for that to be restored. Mm. Well, and not only those ideas of ATARs, but those whole cultures around what those um, particularly elite private schools represent, um, for sure. Mm. Um, thanks. Yeah. So what keeps the conversation going? You know, something like this keeps the conversation going, but how do we get the conversation from conversation to action as well and help more people to feel courageous, um, but not um, but not re-traumatise people by having them to um, keep reminding them of things that they may not wish to, if that's the case as well. Um, I'm, I can see that we have some questions from the audience and um, so Chantal has um, conveyed some of those to us. So um, I'd like to ask some of those now and uh, also invite those people who are now watching us through YouTube to put in a question so that we can um, share those with our panel. And the first question I'd like to ask um, to Natalia, because you mentioned when you first introduced yourself about experiences in New York and New Zealand. So can you talk a little bit about those experiences in the uh, in the courts um, it'd be my pleasure so um just to take a little step backwards i'd mention something called a problem solving court and the premise behind some of these are they differentiate from traditional courts in that they seek to address some of the underlying issues rather than simply focusing on a legal problem um, so for example there's greater judicial case management um, sometimes there may be a multidisciplinary court team, so it's not in the adversarial mechanism. It's more a collaborative approach with participants, um, and you may appropriately involve government agencies and community agencies to assist through that process. Um, so New Zealand, for example, has piloted a specialised sexual offences court. Um, and here, for example, they found that judges and prosecution and defence lawyers were specifically trained about sexual harms and the experience of complainants in court. Um, court processes were, for example, based on best practice guidelines for sexual offences matters, um, and case managers proactively dealt with issues around delay in terms of not so much as reporting, but delay of the process, um, because some may not be aware that most criminal trials take a long time before you are able to be heard and have your trial heard in the court, and that can be a lengthy time and quite a stressful, unnecessarily process for a victim survivor. So in 2019 in New Zealand, um, they did an evaluation of this particular specialized court and they found that there was incredible widespread support for a national rollout of the pilot. Um, and for example, it found that victim survivors had their matters progress more quickly. There weren't as many adjournments. Um, and it found that the quality of the hearings and trials had exponentially improved. Mm -hmm. Judges interfered more often if there was any hint of unacceptable questioning of witnesses. There was better case management that led to earlier guilty pleas, so no needing to re-traumatize the victim survivor through the process. Um, and so that was one example. The New York Sex Offense Court is a problem-solving court, and this means that they have a dedicated judge to handle each case. Um, there's judicial monitoring of people convicted of sexual offenses. There's collaboration with various community agencies to provide adequate support for the victim survivor in court. And that person is also provided for them prior to the event and after. And it has access to services and an opportunity for people to maneuver the process in a way that will be most respectful to them. So for people who've experienced sexual harm, the onus here is on trying to make sure that their voice is being heard in a far more collaborative manner. Um, now, no evaluations have been done of that court just to date yet, but those are just some of the features of what makes those courts a bit different to what our current system mm -hmm. is. Mm. And so how do you introduce something like that into society? I mean, clearly there's two very different places where that's been possible to try these out. So what had to happen in order for those um, at least pilots to begin? 
Yeah, I think a lot of what's happening at the moment in our jurisdiction is the recognition that we may be facing a catalyst moment, that there is a significant need for reform and there's a much more open dialogue. And perhaps maybe I'm, I'm being overly optimistic, perhaps an understanding amongst the wider community that this is an opportunity for change. We, we seem to have reached the peak, whether it's frustration, anger, but also compassion and listening. And perhaps now is the opportunity to have those reforms put in place. People will be more open to listen, whether they're in government, judicial officers, police to start mm. going, okay, let's be a little bit creative about this because obviously change can be quite com confronting for many people um, but equally I think if the dialogue is there and, and the doors are open it's a great opportunity to start engaging in that yep thanks Natalia well this might be a good uh, moment then to ask another question from the audience group um, to uh, Asha actually in relation to how the justice system can find a balance between accommodating the needs of the victim the rights of the accused and broader issues of community safety in the context of sexual violence. Would you be willing to speak with that one? Yeah, sure. I, I can speak to this um, as well. And Natalia can probably uh, provide some more context to this as well. Look, I think that it is always a, a delicate balance when we're talking about um, victims' rights, accused rights, and, and also society in general. But as Natalia said earlier tonight, at the moment, the justice system is incredibly imbalanced when you think about it from the perspective of a victim. They, they have no representative at this point. The prosecution is representing the interests of the state. Um, there's no one there on, on behalf of the victim to ensure that um, procedurally things are just, to ensure that they are uh, you know, being looked after and supported throughout the process in the same way that we must ensure um, there, there is for accused people given the, the significant implications that can arise from being found guilty or pleading guilty. So what I think is important here is when we talk about trying to rebalance the justice system or trying to look at what's wrong with, with the sexual violence and, and thinking about the examples Natalia has just given, that's not taking away rights from anybody. That's not stripping them away from accused people. What it's doing is trying to look at how we can shift and rebalance the justice system so it is actually taking into account some of the difficulties around a, a case that, it, that will often involve um, very little evidence other than one person's narrative of what happened against another person's narrative. So I think that we, we can introduce some mechanisms and, and some um, ways that we can change and improve the justice system that, don't, that will not mean that we are stripping rights away from, from others and it will improve community safety. If we can, if we can create an environment where um, victims are feeling more comfortable to report to police, where their treatment is improved and where they feel like they are going to be heard within the court process, we're going to improve confidence in the system. And by that, we're going to improve the system and the system's response as a whole. So I think that it, it's not a matter of discounting one over the other. And there are ways this can be done. Mary Eliadis, for example, has written quite a lot about victim representation. Uh, it is being um, used in uh, Ireland at the moment where you can actually, um, for sexual assault um, trials, victims are able to get assistance with cross-examination so that they can make sure that they've got a legal representative who's ensuring that they're not being asked questions that they shouldn't be and to ensure mm -hmm. that they're you know, comfortable throughout the process. Factors like that that could be introduced that, that might make a real difference. And the kinds of things that you were talking about before in relation to what other kind of community supports could people have so that the police aren't the first port of call necessarily, so that this is a whole of system support. Mm. Um, George, a question for you in ways that female teachers in schools are able to kind of navigate some of these challenges that they have, um, that they encounter uh, at as a result of sexual harassment. Um, some of the things that you've written about is that some people, you know, survive or mitigate these particular um, sexual harassment approaches. Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which teachers respond to what they experience? Yeah, I think, I think because their experiences are often downplayed and because they know they're not, uh, you know, it's not gonna be handled particularly well and there's not gonna be a significant consequence 
consequences. They, the, what the, my data revealed from the, my talks to with teachers is they tend to also downplay as well. So they engage in actually like a double conversation. They will, they will lament the situation. They will talk about how bad it is. And then they will also at some point start to downplay it as well. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, so, so it's a really difficult position to be in because they love the school, right? They want to, they want to be successful. They're teachers. This is what they do. And, and they just have to deal with this and they just don't have the supports to deal with it because it's just not set up for them. And, and I guess it's not set up to be just in that sense. And, and I guess what I see is just teachers using all sorts of methods in, in which to survive in these schools. And, and I, think, uh, I think that that's what they do. They just work towards that point. Uh, but it, it is tough. It's, it's always challenging to work in schools anyway. Uh, yeah. but, but I think if, if uh, I'm hoping that this kind of conversation uh, gives them a, a voice to talk about the issues of sexism that are in their schools uh, where they find it and, and the issues of not being supported and the issues of being marginalized. And, I, and I'm hoping that the wider conversations that are happening will be, and, and the resources that they might be seeking out right now, because I do get emails from teachers saying, we have this problem, you know, what can we do? Uh, I'm hoping that eventually that this sustained conversation will allow teachers to reach out, to find those resources and to, to work together to, 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 I guess, change their situation for the better. Because, of course, you don't come into those situations expecting those kinds of things to happen, isn't it? You find yourself in that situation as well. And then perhaps there's not the, well, I, I don't know what the induction processes are for those mm. kinds of places, but, you know, what do I do if I'm experiencing these sorts of issues yes. in school and whether that's explicitly part of what, how people uh, help to understand the systems that they're working in? Yeah, I, I don't think it is. And, and I think that... Uh... What, what they find is this, you know, they, they second guess themselves, you know, did I do something? Did the, mm. the stand too close? It's all this kind of in-between stuff and, you know, uh, that makes it really hard to navigate. And I think that's the problem with the silences around these issues as well is that, you know, you're not having these conversations. So, you, you know, you don't really know. And then when you feel that if you're going to report it, that you're not going to be well received. So, and you're going to be blamed for the problem. Uh, and so the, the, the problem just perpetuates and moves along and teachers just do their best to keep keep the lid on these things. And, I, and I, you can sit in the classroom and watch it. You know, it, it's not all boys, it's not all teachers, but a few boys can lead a classroom in, in making a teacher's life hell. And, and they're using uh, sexual harassment to, to gain power in the classroom. I think uh, mm -hmm. scholars have pointed this, long pointed this out. And, but in elite private schools, it, it perhaps not so much about gaining power, but deploying power through sexual harassment because these boys are already empowered because of the uh, unbalanced nature of these schools with the high fee paying parents. Uh, you know, it, it, already the teachers are at a, at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. and, and so they, it's a question of survival really for, for many teachers. Mm, and I can see very, very strong parallels, which I'm sure many people can, about the federal politics and um, in relation to the ways in which people just try and get their head down and, and keep working um, in, in those situations and, and well, those also those issues of power and positioning of, of women as well. Um, so I'm going to change over again uh, now for the, another question that's come from the audience about uh, either for Asha or Natalia, um, if either of you could comment on one of the people who's tuning in here who's read Louise Milligan's Witness and any of your thoughts on whether the criminal justice system is equipped to handle allegations of sexual assault. I guess we've talked about this a little bit, but this is more specific in relation to this particular um, um, Louise Milligan's work. Um, either Natalia or Asher or both of you, if you would like. Yeah, sure. Um, Natalia, do you want to jump in first or? No, I'm more than pleased for you to take it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll start off and then and then you can jump in. Look, I think that I, I think our justice system, in in some ways, it can be equipped. To do to to deal with sexual assault, but I think there are many many problems in, in the way that it's operating at the moment. Um, there was a, an article today in the paper just talking about um, a, a child, a sexual assault victim, who was asked a thousand questions as part of the cross examination process. 
that's not like you know that that is not a good system that's not working effectively um but i think some of the the key issues that have come up again and and i refer again here to the work of rachel bergen who's looked um very closely at analyzing how consent operates in criminal trial processes in victoria and what she found was often um, the defence will be drawing on victim blaming narratives that, that permeate within society. So things around um, whether the victim had been drinking, whether they'd um, been involved in taking drugs, what they were wearing, whether they were on a date, whether they'd engaged in conversation with the perpetrator beforehand. And, and, and all these types of factors were not only infiltrating um, the trial, but they were being used as questions um, of victims uh, co and complainants within the trial process. And lots of factors where we've seen many reforms introduced to the legal system to try and prevent this from happening. So for example, to try and stop um, your prior sexual history as being something that can be admitted in evidence or be asked about. Um, but we would see uh, in, in Rachel's work, and there's plenty of it out there to read, that um, you would see the defence dancing around these questions and coming back uh, to these issues, these same issues over and over again and reiterating it to the point where the, the victim is almost torn into a place of going, well, I guess, yeah, maybe I did speak to him that night or may, maybe I did dance near him or and, and factors like this that we see as being very problematic. So I think that while we're still um, working with the traditional adversarial system in the way that it's operating, we're not going to see an effective response for, for handling sexual assault in the way that we might be in, in some of the examples that Natalia gave from New Zealand and New York, mm. where we're seeing quite different models being used to, to try and address some of these imbalances. So I'll hand over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I mean, for me, I think I dedicate a large part of my job and my life to um, bettering the criminal justice system. So I think it's an evolution and by no means are we at the perfect stage by any stretch of the imagination on a number of issues across the board. But one thing that I think is so crucial for me is observing the various reforms that have happened across the timeline that it is an ongoing discussion. And I think to its credit in Victoria, we are obviously working towards always bettering the process. So currently the Victorian Law Reform Commission is um, in the midst of conducting an inquiry, which is focusing on ways of how to better the current process. And they have specific questions and it, the start of that particular inquiry is recognizing the challenges that we've spoken about this evening, the attrition rates, the, the gendered nature of the offending, the reason why people may be reluctant to make complaints. And I think that's a powerful process to recognize that obviously they're being open about the challenges that the existing system is facing and, and working towards somehow bettering it. Um, so I think, is it capable of handling? I think with significant reform and, and works, of course it can be. Um, and obviously it's an ongoing evolution, absolutely. Thanks, thanks. Um, Chantelle, can I throw over to you now um, as somebody who is uh, monitoring the chat through YouTube? Um, so any questions or comments that you might have to feed into our panellists? Yes, definitely, Mandy. It's um, going hotcakes at the moment on the on the chat. Um, one of the things I did want to mention as well to the panelists um, that there has been comments about that the, this webinar has been very impressive in the way that it's also allowing to spread the awareness regarding this very important issue. So thank you for that. Um, I've got an interesting comment here that we'd like. Um, a few of the panelists to um, answer to, which is about the that another challenge is equipping organisations with appropriate response capabilities, like supporting those involved, um, how to involve the police um, processes if re relevant, and you know, and how to go through the investigation uh, processes and guidelines. Um, so I guess the question for the panelists is what would you recommend in how to start that those conversations or within organizations um george would you like to start us on that one um good question i think, <laughs> I think it's uh, i think you've talked a little bit about some of those things already yeah, but i think i have i think how do you start you just start you know i think you just 
have to start. Uh, if you haven't looked in the papers lately or you haven't seen the news, I think it's already, it's already if you haven't had that conversation, go in tomorrow and start having that conversation about what you need in order to deal with these situations more effectively and support people when they come forward and report it. And I think that just, yeah, just start. That's as simple as that. Mm. And maybe is it like starting with a with trusted people? Uh, I mean, it's not just sure. I mean, randomly, but thinking about yeah. who you share that with, yeah. Teachers, teachers tend to find their people within schools and have those conversations in trusted groups. I think that's how it works in all organizations. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think if they're not having that conversation now, I'd be surprised. I think they would be having that conversation. And I think, again, this is where we don't want to limit the, the, the response to uh, better education programs for kids. It's also all these other things that teachers need to deploy these programs and teachers need to support each other and to respond to these kind of things. And I, I think so we have to really look holistically. And I guess when I think about schools, uh, like independent schools, it's about that, uh, you know, transparency and, and letting, you know, do getting access to these schools is not a particularly easy thing to do for scholars. And I think that that also would help uh, greater transparency uh, with these schools, which is always it's going to be difficult when they have such reputational risks involved. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think we've reached a point, this is where moral courage is required because you know, reputa reputational risk aside, you simply have to act. Mm. And um, previously you mentioned about, you know, some of the difficulties negotiating because of parents' expectations about what schools will do or how to behave. Do you think it's uh, part of the school responsibility in terms of equipping parents, uh, building parent capacity in that way, to be able to have those conversations or to be able to name things that are inappropriate? Yeah, I, I guess this is where the unevenness between the parent body and, and the teachers, it, it makes it a very difficult conversation to have. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, when you look around at the resources that are available to you now in having that conversation, I think perhaps now might be the time. Maybe now is where you, you have the moment to actually have that conversation uh, because it, it's in the media, it's everywhere, and, and parents probably are expecting to have that conversation now. So mm -hmm. Maybe point. it's about when Natalia mentioned taking, uh, taking the opportunity when it's there. Uh, I think the opportunity is there. And mm -hmm. I think people can, you know, take the advantage of that right now. Mm -hmm. um, Asher or Natalia, would you, you want to comment on organisational capacity at all? Yeah, I, I would just like to um, echo what George has said there, that this is a conversation. It should, should not be limited to be having in schools or, or with parents. It, have this in your, as, as George said, start now. Have this conversation in your organisation, where, where you're working now. Have it in your family. Have it in your friendship group. Um, you know, we, we live and breathe this stuff. I know um, Natalia and I would be able to have conversations with all friends and families about these issues all the time. And, and but particularly now is is the time. As, as George said, it's in the it's in the, every newspaper. It's on every media alert. It's on Twitter. It's on Facebook. Everything's coming up to tell you that here's some of the major cultural problems that are going on in society. Here is sexual violence is a major issue. Our politicians aren't responding well enough. It's our schools aren't responding well enough. Or well, maybe we need to think, well, as a society, we're not responding well enough. So I, I love that idea of, of just starting the conversation where, wherever you are, what, whatever you're doing, because it, it is an important conversation to have, whether you're talking about, um, you know, primary school children or you're talking about your colleagues at work. I think th this is really, really important. And I, I just echo that we do, if, as George said, if you don't have the resources there in the organisations that you're currently working in or that you are involved in or somewhere where you, you know, do volunteer or support work, if there aren't resources there, what do you need? What, what mm. would you have to do if someone disclosed or came forward or was experiencing harassment mm. in that organisation? So I, I think that that's a great message to communicate let's just start this conversation mm. and learning to take this conversation seriously um and it, what does it mean to believe people who are um, making closures as well because i think you know there's some of the issues that people are um, not currently coping with particularly well um either um in in those factors um natalia did you want to add anything to that um, only just a brief comment. I think what's also been interesting is these mediated cases at the moment provide all these organizations with a clear bad case studies, as in you have all these clear things you can point to and say, 
well, I can't believe that would ever happen at, for example, at this organization. So it makes you reflect and go, okay, so what mechanisms do we have here to support people as best as we can? Because, it, you know, if any organization is susceptible to this, and earlier in the year we had, you know, spotlights on sexual harassment in the legal profession, there is no profession or organization that I think is immune to these issues. And I think it's a good opportunity and a catalyst for really reflecting on what can we, what are our existing mechanisms and where can we better ourselves in? Absolutely. Mm. Thanks. Um, Chantelle, any other questions that you would like to bring in from our um, participants in the audience? Yeah, I do have one uh, last question that um, probably to follow on from, from that um, question is more about um, what, what advice would you give to a schools, teachers, people in general that are fearful of engaging with topics Pro, with these topics, programs, materials, uh, uh, particularly when they're non-normative topics? I guess, George, that might, might be something for you to begin with. At least. Well, these are not usual topics, but these are not usual times either. And I guess, I guess it's one of fear is, is articulated in almost any institution. You can think about fearfulness and that would prevent you from acting. And I, I guess this is where I talked about moral courage. I think it's, uh, it's for all of us to think about how we, what kind of society we want to live in, what kind of schools do we want to have, what kind of institutions do we want to work in. And you could just start small by talking to the people around you that you feel safe with. And that's probably the best place to start and uh, and then go from there. And then like uh, Asha mentioned as well, you know, find the resources you need, find the support you need and work together. And I think it's that organizing that really will shape the, the future rather than waiting for, you know, the blokes to get it. You know, I think it's that real organizing, talking to each other at, 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 at the ground level that will, will hopefully turn the tide. Mm -hmm. Um, Asher or Natalia, would you like to comment at all on that issue? Yeah, look, I think I'd just say that, well, I, I can understand that it doesn't um, necessarily, like the, I can understand hesitation in wanting to talk about these, these topics. They are contentious, they're sensitive, they're difficult. They are difficult conversations to have. But unfortunately, as, as, as I said earlier, that the Australian Bureau of Statistics are reporting one in five women, one, one in 20 men have experienced sexual assault. It is, it, it is not uncommon, unfortunately, but we don't have the mechanisms in place that are properly supporting our victim survivors going through this, that whether that is through formal legal channels, if they so desire to do so, or whether that's being able to reach out to friends and families, loved ones or, or people in authority or, or support other support mechanisms. So I think that, that this is unfortunately not necessarily not a normative conversation to have anymore. And I, I think what we've seen over the past few weeks, looking at the different women who have come forward to explain their, their experiences, um, that, that we're going to continue to see these types of um, comments coming out. If we think back to, to the Me Too movement when, when it sort of took hold um, several years ago, there were thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of people coming forward talking about their experiences, largely women, but also men who were experiencing sexual violence. So I think this is something that we need to accept is unfortunately part of society. So what can we do to help prevent, educate and support? And, and as Natalia said earlier, and believe. So mm. I think we, we do need to be having these conversations. And yes, they're difficult, but you know, we, we should be doing it and, and we need to start with consent and respect. Mm, thanks. Natalia? I couldn't have said it better than Asha. And I think one thing I've been also reflecting on is um, for those of us who sort of maybe at the forefront of these discussions to be gentle with those who are still learning along the way, because I've been conscious of creating safe spaces to be able to, from my position, address and, and sort of perhaps guide certain conversation in a certain way, but it makes you realise you have to have those gentle conversations as well. So I think it is important to make sure it's an open dialogue, respectful in every capacity and to, you know, be prepared to listen on both sides and to be prepared to be open to listening on both sides. Absolutely. Mm. Thanks very much. Yeah, I think these are very important messages for us to remember and, and especially in the passions that have been, you know, brought up around these particular issues. How do we start to have the conversations with 
that different generational member who might have a completely different view or that, uh, you know, people in our friends, our family, our work colleagues, it's right. These are not easy conversations to have. And, and often we are surrounded by people who are like-minded. And so we can, you know, affirm all the sorts of things that we believe in, but stepping out into that different zone takes a lot of courage. And like you're saying, practicing that, starting to find trusted people, thinking about the messages that we send ourselves um, and trying to be open-minded uh, are really, really important. Um, now, we're just about to wind up. Now we're getting very, very close to time. And I think the panel have done an amazing job of um, answering all these questions and helping us to better understand the issues. And, and hopefully, um, as a consequence, the people who are viewing tonight going away, yourself feeling more empowered to have the conversations, feeling more informed about some of these issues and um, thinking about how you might take the next step within your own organisation or with your own family or community group. And I really um, say fantastic. Um, thank you very much for the fantastic effort from George and Asha and Natalia um, for your contributions tonight. It is really wonderful. And of course, you can find their work if you want to have a look for their work on the web. And um, the three of them have been doing very um, current work that uh, you'll see published around in terms of the reports and also in, in the media too. So as I said at the beginning, this is the first of these special humanity series webinars and our next one coming up is on Thursday the 13th of May, so quite soon, uh, the age of misinformation. So you can um, imagine that there's some very lively conversations to be had about that topic as well. And again, we'll have our experts from arts, education and law who will discuss these issues around fake news and, and implications for society. So um, we look forward to seeing everybody at that particular um, event and to encourage others to come along too. I'd also like to thank um, our audience tonight for coming along. It's um, uh, fantastic to be able to have this opportunity to be able to reach out to people around the world. As I said at the beginning, having this sort of technology means that we are much more flexible in when, when we watch these things and, and who can get access to them. So we hope that you found it really helpful and informative and stimulating for your own thinking as well. And also we have a fantastic crew behind the scenes who you can't see, but well, you heard Chantelle's voice uh, and they have done an amazing job of putting this session together. So I'd like very much on behalf of our panelists and myself to thank um, Chantelle and Luke and Megan and Ellie and Adonis for all of the work that you have done in um, helping us to get this fantastic session up and going. And if you have been thinking, well, what they're talking about tonight has really prompted my thinking about what I would like to do next in my own career, what I would like to learn about. Um, there's a slide here to give you some suggestions about further study options that you can follow up um, either in law um, and education as well as arts and humanities. Again, Tweet about tonight if you found it something interesting. There's questions that have come up. Of course, the conversation doesn't have to stop with what's happened on the panel. We encourage you to keep this talking going as all of our panellists have um, confirmed tonight. So thanks very much again, everybody. That's it for this evening. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next time.